Of all the genres of stories that I read on the channel here, I think perhaps the one that's most requested is post-apocalypse. And I have to say I'm always happy about this because it's one of my favourite genres too. And I was delighted a couple of weeks ago when a diary format story came along called The Wanderer's Diary. Now, I thought this was really good and worked pretty well as a standalone story, but it was just begging to be uh, continued. And I'm very happy to say that it has been. So, tonight's story is a follow-up to that one. I've put the link to the first part in the video description for those who didn't get to listen to it. So, my dear friends, it's time once again to sit back and relax with your favourite drink and we'll listen. Day 22. So, 39 shots, 30 targets. Let's make them count. Godspeed, Dave. Godspeed. Well, maybe I should take up praying. Seriously, we actually made it. Kind of. It took us the better part of two hours and 38 of our shots, but we got all the chasers down to the ground. Ecstatic as we were, we immediately climbed down the tree to link up with the caravan again. Rookie mistake. One of the chasers had only played dead. Or maybe he really was in his death throes. Doesn't matter. Fact is, he bit Dave in the leg. Got a good bite in. In turn, he got our last bullet. Discounting our express tickets to the grade upstairs. The wound wasn't anything too serious. Given proper rest, it'd heal in a week or two. But, well. We were one and a half days worth of walking away from what remained of civilization. But given Dave's state, it'd be closer to three days. Three days without anything on us. No rations, no water, nothing. Well, I managed to bandage his wound with strips of our clothes, so he won't bleed out overnight. We made some headway in the remaining daylight, and are currently camped out in a semi-cave in the roots of a truly enormous pine. Let's see what the future brings. Day 23. We made some headway. I can't say it was a good or bad result. It's hard to judge the ideal speed of a wounded one. We stumbled over a clean brook, so water should be fine until we get to Blaster, but I didn't have time to forage for food. We agree not to waste our remaining ammo on wildlife. Some time without food is possible, after all. Day 24. We followed the 32 into Blaster, but nobody was there. Not even bodies, in case Marv's and Gloria's group had betrayed us. Not that I seriously entertained that idea, but it would have been an explanation. Maybe the group's hiding in some buildings. I don't see why, but maybe. So I decided to fire one shot in the air. Probably a stupid decision, but we didn't have any better ideas. Given that it was early evening already and I was tired from half-dragging Dave the whole day, we quickly made camp. I chose the display area of a clothing store on the main street. It would shelter us, but wouldn't hide us from our companions if they'd be searching. And if they don't, well, we're dead anyway. Day 25 I should really reconsider my atheism. A small search party found us overnight. There were some familiar faces, but also some of the new group. At first I was startled when their noises woke me up. I nearly blasted them with my last shot, but luckily I recognised them before that. The bigger group decided not to make camp in Blester proper, but instead moved to the city's main mining camp. One hour's worth of walking to the northwest, and of course our group followed suit. Apparently some stragglers heard the shot, and our saviours were dispatched. They hauled us back to what we now call New Blester, and practically paraded us through the street. Dave was brought to the infirmary. Yes, they already have a proper infirmary, even with a somewhat sterile ER. We never got round to doing that in our old camp. Given that I was only starved, not actually injured, my medical treatment consisted of a visit to the mess hall. During and after my meal, 
I was brought up to speed by Stephen, one of my old guys. I guess I have to stop thinking like that. There no longer is they and we, only a bigger we. Apparently the rationale behind using the mining camp instead of the city was the better defensive capability. New Blester is built relatively open compared to old Blester's dense housing. This, and the chimneys of the blast furnaces, makes an excellent observation platform. The other group apparently had a really detailed and effective government system, well, I guess compared to our almost tribal structure, and so we integrated ourselves into the better system. Now, there are several work groups, each committed to a single task, like farming, construction and maintenance, medics, and so on. Each work group has one or more heads, reporting to the council, which our old chieftain Carl has been made part of. I'm thinking of joining either the city guard, or, well, army if you will, or the scouts. Over my journey, I've come to appreciate the great outdoors, so hunting and foraging are right up my alley now. On the matter of the city guard, they're not an army, <laughs> I worded that badly, they're more like an army officer's corps with a flexed hierarchy. If we need them, they're allowed to recruit anyone they see fit into their ranks to bolster their numbers. Now, call me a cynic, but that's just the setup to a coup d'etat, isn't it? Day 26. Scouts, it is. My group leader is now a guy called Corbin, and my colleagues are Kevin, Marvin, not the one who invited us, another one, and Sarah. Given that we're only deployed when something is in dire need, usually food, we also help out where we can. For today, I'm still excused from work to regain my strength, but starting tomorrow, I'll join my scout group and help erecting a perimeter fence around New Blaster. They already have around 20 meters worth of fence standing. Since we're in an ore processing facility, we have the tools for at least primitive ironworking, so that's no problem. Only a lot of effort. Dave will be okay. His wounds are properly treated. His malnourishment has significantly delayed the healing process, but the medics think he will be up and running in three weeks tops, with no lasting damage. Of course, he is happy, but Tanya was so overjoyed at his safe return and expected recovery, I thought she would burst. I didn't know they were a thing. Well, whatever. If they're happy, good for them. Day 27 I have officially joined the Corbin squad today. He hates that name, and that's why we use it. Jokes aside, Corbin is a great guy. Sort of a jolly, nice uncle vibe. Kev and Marv are alright blokes too. But Sarah? Well, when I first saw her, I thought, Sarah? <laughs> like Sarah Connor. And that fits her perfectly. Tough one, but nice if you're one of her cubs. Not that she's the motherly type, <laughs> no. Just that Kev Joe that she could wrestle a bear, and I for one believe that. The work on the fence was dull. Manual labor. Following the instructions of one construction group head. Assembling fence segments, setting them up, linking them with the existing fence. Secure and repeat. Not bad work, just dull. But the construction head said they'd need more material to keep working at the pace that they were and Corbin offered for us to scavenge in Old Blaster for chain-link fences and other appropriate parts. During dinner, he presented the idea to the council and got the go-ahead. Tomorrow we should round up material on provisions to allow for a three-day expedition into Old Blaster, dismantle anything useful, and transport it home. Plus, we'll get one of the construction guys to help us evaluate the quality and usefulness of our finds. Day 28 we set off at around ten today. Turns out, our construction guy is Tom, one of my old friends. Of course, we were armed for this expedition, and Marv instantly identified my rifle as a Garand. <laughs> Neat, I guess. It was always only <laughs> rifle for me. We arrived in the commercial part of Blester, and started ripping off fences and corrugated iron plates like hungry vultures. By evening, we'd already filled two of our four carts with materials. Their quality was good, according to Tom, and judging by our pace, we'll probably return with full pockets by tomorrow evening. Dinner was quite interesting today. While we were cooking at the campfire, 
Sarah sang something. She is originally from the Kazan Mountains, but more to the south, and these were old nursery rhymes and other childhood songs of hers. I didn't understand a word of it, but it was beautiful. Day 29 Our wagons were filled to the brim by early afternoon, so we returned to New Blester a good while before dinner. The fence was coming along well, although progress had slowed noticeably, likely because of the lack of material and the makeshift fields around the perimeter were beginning to show the first green. Oh, I'm no farmer, but I asked one of the workers expanding the fields, and they claim the first potato harvest will be in two months. Seems a bit fast to me, but again, I'm no farmer. The construction head was delighted about that quick return, even more so when he saw what we'd brought. He agreed with Tom that our bounty was exactly what they need. Well, that's why he came with us in the first place, I guess. We unloaded our carts in a warehouse near the fence perimeter. Then Corbin gave us the day off. But tomorrow we, and that includes Tom, are to set out again, procuring more fence parts. Even though I was away for not even two days, the town has already changed. Well, that's to be expected. The original group has only been here for two weeks, so they're still settling in and appropriating the facilities to whatever they need. And then the influx of another hundred just five days ago. No matter what your work group is actually supposed to do, pretty much everybody is working in or for construction now. Day 30. Old Blester has many treasures yet to be recovered. Like a hardware store. I don't know why plundering it wasn't the first thing we did when searching for building materials, but whatever. We're stocked up to cart capacity already, and we'll return first thing in the morning. I know these are expeditions into what is technically no man's land, but it still feels like, well, going down to the hardware store. Day 31 We returned on time for the lunch break, and were promptly reintegrated into the construction group. The fence has about doubled in length since we first set out, and apparently they're also working on a similarly sized segment on the opposite side of town. But still, we got a long ways to go. The more experienced workers have also begun to work on a proper gate. Apparently, we'll get three. One for each cardinal direction, discounting west. We won't need to go into the mountains that often. Day 32. The day began as another construction shift. But we weren't even in proper working rhythm yet when a messenger came to get Corbin. Like our old camp, New Blester also had a town transceiver, and it's been up and working for some time now. And this morning, it had picked up on something. Apparently, a group of Uranese refugees whose original camp had been overrun had fled east into the Kazan Range. They were followed by a chaser pack, presumably the one that had raided their camp. The refugees had entrenched themselves in the old Mount Mochen Observatory, but were now being sieged out by the chasers. The council had decided to help them, and were now asking for every scout leader if they felt capable of reaching and helping the Uranese, or at least recover anything useful they left behind, if the siege succeeded. Corbin thought us capable, so the rest of the day was spent readying up for the trek. We would go through the northern Boral woods as long as possible, to keep the actual mountain part as short as possible, only going west over Mount Trajan, and then up Mount Mochen. The journey would take four to five days, but first we had to cross the Tyre, immediately north of New Blester. There were plans to build a bridge over it, but that was only a good idea as of now. There was a ford over the Tyre, a bit east of here, but the current is strong there. We'll have to see tomorrow if we should risk crossing it. Day 33. We reached the ford by noon and crossed it easily. The lack of rain over the last few days seemed to have calmed it a little bit, or maybe the strength of the current was exaggerated by the original scouts. Either way, after crossing we veered north through the woods. We're currently camping on a big rock in a clearing, and we can see Mount Rajan from here already. We're making good time so far. Day 34. Today was a really uneventful day. 
We reached the foot of Mount Trajan in the afternoon, and are now about halfway up the mountainside. Our camp in a crease of the mountain face isn't really comfortable, but the nightly winds up here are worse. Day 35 We made good progress today. If we forced it, we could have arrived at the observatorium sometimes in the evening, but facing a chaser pack, one powerful enough to bring down a settlement nonetheless, while being tired out from a day's worth of hiking, in the dark, no thank you. We can see the very tip of the observatory's antenna array from our camp, and I guess we'll be there after an hour of walking. Corbin decided we would not break camp and leave our stuff here, the rationale being we'd have to return here anyway, and this way we wouldn't be weighed down unnecessarily. A valid strategy, but it makes me uncomfortable anyway. Day 36. Today was eventful. We broke camp in the early dawn, planning to arrive at the observatory with the sun to our backs. Well, we did. We stopped on the very tip of the last little hill before reaching the plateau the observatory stood on. The building itself was quite run down. One and a half decades in the mountains winds without maintenance will do that to you. We saw makeshift barricades in the ground and first floor doors and windows. None seemed breached, but we couldn't see the backside. But judging by the twenty-odd chasers lazing around the plateau, the siege wasn't over quite yet. We were just silently discussing how to handle this problem when Sarah just stiffened up and motioned us to be quiet. Of course, we obliged. But not ten seconds later, a chase across the hilltop directly in front of us still unaware of us. It seemed drowsy. Well, as drowsy as a black, leathery monster dog can look. Chasers can't see too well. We'll never know how it didn't smell us. It was just setting down one of its front paws when Sarah shot up, jamming her knife in its throat and wrestling it to the ground. It happened completely silently, discounting the little yelp that Chelsea made halfway to the ground. It maybe took two seconds in total. None of the other chasers seemed to notice, so we were fine for now. After the relieved sighs and admiring looks towards Sarah had subsided, we came up with a plan. I was a good runner, but weaponry-wise, the weakest of the bunch. The others would fall back a bit, setting up a nice firing zone. When they gave the go-ahead, I'd take a few shots at the pack, hopefully killing one or two, and then run through the firing zone, drawing the pack with me. Risky but the best we could come up with. The few minutes of setup were the longest few in my entire life. I wasn't this nervous, even up in the tree. Then the go-ahead came in the form of a short whistle from Kev. I got into a comfortable firing position, slowly crossed the hill, taking care not to step on the first victim of today, and took aim. I searched for the meanest-looking one, and found him near the observatory's entrance, as well as two smaller ones. These four shots were the loudest in my entire life, or it felt as much at least. I turned and ran without even looking if I'd hit anything. Later we'd see that I took down all three. I was maybe halfway through the firing zone when the pack crossed the hill, and my companions lit them up. All of them had automatic weapons, so it was quite the noise but it did its job. The largest part of the pack had fallen victim to our trap, and the few stragglers or otherwise survivors were picked off easily. We expected the refugees to be wary of us, maybe taking some shots at us, but they quickly opened up, figuratively and literally. There were eleven people, four women, four men, and three children. They looked healthy, but their supplies were pretty much empty by now, so it took no great convincing for them to join New Blester. Historical differences be damned. But before returning, we turned the observatory inside out. Although we found some quite valuable things, most of them were too big to be easily transported or even demounted, so we left with only a handful of electronic parts and what little rations our new friends had remaining. We looped back over to our campsite and will spend the night on the very summit of Mount Trajan. Oh. I'm looking forward to the nightly view. Day 37 The view was amazing. 
both at night as well as in the early morning. The day itself was quite uneventful, but our conversations with the Uranese were interesting, especially those about the old times. The kids were scared of us at first, especially Sarah, as drenched in tracer blood as she was, but quickly warmed up to us, especially to Sarah. I guess Big Mama Bear is becoming more real by the day. Our camp was somewhere near the clearing from four days ago, but we couldn't quite find it. Not that it's a big problem. Setting up shop was especially nice today because of the kids. <laughs> they were quite lively, collecting firewood and berries and whatnot. And they don't complain or slow us down in any way. I think we'll be home tomorrow, and our new friends are looking forward to it. Day 38. We're not home just yet. The ford has become unpassable for the kids, and the weather is worsening. We expect rain by tomorrow evening, maybe earlier. Then the ford will be completely uncrossable. I've heard the tire calms at night, so we are waiting and hoping. Attempting a night crossing sounds like a bad idea, but maybe it isn't. Day 38, night. We just crossed the tire. I think it's around midnight, but hell if I know. The text will probably yell at us for having used the flashlights, but whatever. I'll try to catch some sleep before morning. We still have a few hours to hike. Day 39 The hike back to New Blester went off without a hitch. In Old Blester, we even met a foraging group on the return, so we linked up with them and introduced the new citizens. The council was happy to see the newcomers, saying they'll take them off our hands. Well, I'm no HR guy either, so better this way. They were a bit disappointed in our meager loot, but, but we made infantry up there, and the techs insist on a large-scale expedition once the tire bridge is finished. They're especially interested in the generators and radio equipment, but by what I heard, they want to disassemble the whole facility. I visited Dave again. Told him about my trip. He didn't believe me at first. I don't think he does even now. But he's doing well. He can walk without a cane, but still limps. The medics expect that to heal out completely within the week. So, all's well that ends well. Tomorrow's my free day. Well earned after our hike, I want to add. I don't know what I'll do yet, but Marvin told me about a calm part of the tyre. Good for swimming or lazing around in the water. It's technically outside city bounds, but only five minutes away. So I think I'll be fine if I go. Well, another fantastic episode from this. I'm so glad it's turned into a series. And it sounds like it's got a long, long way to go as well, doesn't it? Certainly hope so. Well... The next part is yet to be written, but I am looking forward to it already, and I hope you are too. Well, special shout out to everybody who is still listening to me here in 2019. Uh, been going for three and a half years, nearly four years now. Can it be that long? Oh my god, it is. And you're still here with me, and I just wanted to give you a quick thanks for sticking around. Longer stories are on their way. I've uh, got a lot more time in the day now to do the recording. So, lots of more, lots more stories than you're used to. Sound good? hope so. Okay, well, that is definitely enough for one night, but I will be back again very soon, my dear friends. Until then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it, if you like, on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt, and, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?